If you have a Bible with you, perhaps you turn with me to the, to the book of Ruth again. And we're going to continue on in our uh, wee mini-series on Ruth. And we're going to finish off chapter 1 today. Um, and we're going to be looking at our theme, which is a faithful God requires faithful followers. So let's read the first chapter of Ruth together. Ruth chapter 1 then. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Machlon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Machlon and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left that place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is, bitter for me, bitter, it is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realised that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. A faithful God requires faithful people. Well, how do we see that in that passage? You know, I read a lovely story of a man called Senator Mark Hatfield. It was a while back now. And he was visiting... Um, Calcutta in the days where Mother Teresa and her her nuns were caring for the sick and the dying. And they ran a place called the House of the Dying. And this was a place in Calcutta where people had given up or they just couldn't afford to keep their relatives and they would just bring them and deposit them at the door. And these poor people would just perish in the street. And Mother Teresa and her her sisters, of course, they they didn't have any real medical expertise or a lot of supplies. And they just tended to these people and cared with them often accompanying them until they died. Well, this man, Mark Hatfield, um, is recorded as telling the story of how he went and spoke to her after he watched her. And he was so overwhelmed with the suffering himself just by observing, he went up to her and he said, how can you bear the load without being crushed by it? And Mother Teresa, in usual fashion, responded, Senator, I'm not called to be successful. I'm just called to be faithful. And that, of course, was a great challenge to him, and certainly was a great challenge to me as I read it. Now, we we began our story last week looking at the family history of this lady called Naomi and her husband Elimelech and their two sons, Machlon and Kilion. 
and how they travelled because the land was in famine. They went to Moab, which was a neighbouring country, and they set up home there. Well, of course, eventually Elimelech died. Their sons grew up and married Moabite women, and then the boys died. And Naomi was left with her son's widows. Now life, we know, for women in the ancient Near East, and certainly in the East at the moment, isn't, pretty, isn't good, it's pretty desperate. And Naomi makes a decision uh, to go back to Judah because she hears that there's been a break in the famine and that <coughs> God has provided and the famine has broken and people are being fed. But she's got a dilemma. Because what do you do with the girls? Now we made some assumptions last week based upon the text we recognize that Jewish law made provision for a brother or relative to take on the widow of a deceased relation. Now that's in the law. But there was a problem. So she's got a dilemma and she's got a problem. The problem is the decision to go to Moab in the first place really wasn't socially acceptable because people were under the command not to be involved with other countries, not to infect themselves because they had all kinds of strange practices, and God understands that perfectly well, how easy it is for us to be drawn to these things and drawn away from, him, from his worship. So that wasn't socially acceptable, but they went for all that time. And then to bring them back, if there were relatives, and we know that there were because we have hindsight, of course, then there was possibly bad blood there because that part of the family was the ones who were disobedient in the first place. And then there was the added problem that she would have to possibly persuade a distant relative who she didn't know to take on a foreign wife of a relative that they'd never seen with all of their religious baggage. And we think we've got problems. <laughs> so she was in a dilemma. It was a very real problem that she was having to face. So a solution, and she's like all of us, she's thinking through it logically. She's not thinking, what would Jesus do? She's not doing what we would like people to think. She was saying... How can I deal with this one? I know. I'll send them home to their families. That at least gives them a chance. So you can't say she was a baddie there. She was actually saying, well, well look, you know, I haven't got to face the issue, but then they don't have to face the issue either of being rejected, but also they get a chance at a new family, so it's just send them home. But then Ruth refuses to go. And we saw last week that Ruth gave up all of her own physical and religious heritage and makes the God of Israel her God. Or maybe she made that commitment sometime in the past before. And we talked about maybe the richness of this family, who actually were really quite serious about their faith, but they were thinking in practical terms about providing for their family. But somehow or other, Ruth had come to trust in Naomi's God in spite of Naomi's difficult experiences. And last week we concluded that here we have a picture of a genuine pilgrim with a faith in God that sees beyond the bitter setbacks, that knows freedom from the so-called securities and comforts of the world, and experiences the courage to venture into the unknown and the strange, recognising that actually God is in control here. And this demonstrates a radical commitment in the relationships appointed by God. And Ruth actually, and this was our conclusion, is an example even at this early stage to every single one of us. It's almost as if she had an insight into faith that would have been otherwise been regarded as impossible for someone without the right background. But she must have been taught well because the law instructs God's people to welcome the outsider. Now, that's very interesting, actually, because you think about it. This family, Elimelech and Naomi and their two boys, were strangers in that foreign land. They were obviously at home and accepted by them, and they welcomed these girls as their own. In fact, in Leviticus 19, it says, When an alien lives with you in your land, do not mistreat him. The alien living with you must be treated as one of you, one of your native born. Love him as yourself, for you were aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now, I'm not sure this is a scripture that's read and practiced much in our world today. When I think about some of these refugees at the moment being drowned. You know, it's an interesting attitude, isn't it, towards asylum seekers. In effect, that's exactly what these ladies coming back to Judah are. Naomi's made a home in Moab. Now she's coming back to her original home. And it's all about coming home. But Ruth is coming back and she's a real stranger to this place. 
Their return to Bethlehem then causes something of a stir. It's a bit of a sensation. In fact, the Hebrew word that is used here for stirred actually talks about agitation. It causes commotion. In actual fact, if you look it up, it talks about the buzzing of bees. That's how the commotion started. And remember, we're talking small town here. And we can see the same word actually used in the Greek language in Matthew's Gospel. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who, was, who is this? That's the kind of effect that their return had had. So actually, when they went to Moab in the first place, that was a big deal for the community. Okay? And it hadn't been forgotten. I don't know about you, but I think that actually confirms our assumptions early on. Leaving to live in Moab wasn't an easy transition because all the warnings would have been there. And I'm sure Naomi and Elimelech got so fed up with it and they were just glad when they got their kids, got their pack and they went. And as they walked along, they were, I'm sure they did this. Well, I think we're doing exactly the right thing, you know. And I don't care what they say, we've still got to feed the kids. And after all, what sort of job are you going to get back there? There's no food. Can you imagine the discussion going on as they're walking along into, into Moab? And then they get there and they see how fertile it is, how good it is, even though they're at the bottom rung of the social scale. And they say, wow, we can live. Actually, God must be blessing us. After all, look how good it is. Now that's pretty current, you know. Most, many of us have been there making decisions against the counsel that we've received and then we say we don't regret the thing. But I'll tell you what happens later on down the line. When you start thinking things through and you start reflecting, there's a tinge of sadness that we didn't realise just how much the people who we thought wanted to ruin our lives actually loved us. And that's why they said what they said. And it's evident that Naomi has been a, a faithful wife. We saw last week that she clearly influenced Ruth for the better and taught her well. And so that even in her own dark night of the soul, the younger one had stuck with her all the way. And I think verse 20, look at it. Don't call me Naomi, she says. Call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. Keep that in the back of your mind. She had been the one who caused all the commotion when they'd left. Now she was the one who was causing the commotion on her return, but notice her defen the defense of her actions, and she is unwilling to admit her own mistakes. And what does she do? Well, I'll tell you exactly what she does. She shifts the blame onto God. Easy, isn't it, to blame someone you can't see? Almost as if it's God's fault that she's made mistakes in her life. And again, that's so real. But do you know what that does? That takes me right back to Genesis chapter 3. Listen to these few verses. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the animals in the, the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from, fr from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you mustn't touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, said the serpent. For God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God because you'll know good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Listen to this bit. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Okay. <laughs> then, the, yeah, 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 just think about it. Okay, then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? And here it is. He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the fruit of that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman, she gave it to me. She saw some fruit in the tree and I ate it. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is, what is this you have done? She said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. You see, shifting the blame all the time. What came about was judgment. 
Because shifting the blame is a cop-out. It's too easy. It's too convenient. Don't call me Naomi, she said, which actually means pleasant. Call me Mara because my life is bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me pleasant? Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has put this misfortune on me. And you can see her feeling sorry for herself going down and down and down and down and down. And everyone's looking at her saying, what on earth is she talking about? See, this is a clever strategy. And I don't suppose many people actually were that convinced. But then again, you see, she, this was her secret. You see, she had a tale of woe to tell. And if there's anything the people of God like, it's a tale of woe. Oh, isn't it great? You know, a scandal. That's always the thing. Is, you know, if I was to ask you to tell me something, we mentioned this at the deacon's court, didn't we? In the, de in the devotions there. You know, you have asked to talk about something negative. People will tell you when, what time, who said what and why they said it? Every single detail of a negative thing. But then when it comes to a pleasant thing, and you know, it takes us a while, but actually, then we start thinking about blessings. And I'll tell you what happens. We kick ourselves. Because suddenly we start thinking about the good, good things God has put in our lives. And then we start realizing again that we're participating in the divine nature. And then we realize the value that God is putting on us and it lifts us again. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 4 quickly. And let's read this out loud together. I just want you to read these few verses. And it doesn't matter what version you've got. Verse 4, Philippians 4, verse 4 through 9. Right, we're going to read together. Everyone got it? Here we go, let's read it together. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have heard or learned or received or heard from me, seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Burn that into your soul. That is so very important. Because every time those negative things come along, we actually end up, end up shifting the blame onto everyone else. And we do not face reality. And we do not live transparency and transparently. And if there's anything our world needs, it's transparency in the people of God. You see, Naomi could have returned to Bethlehem with her head held high, you know. She could have spoken to them and told them about all the positive things about Moab. She could have talked about their life in Moab. She could have talked about the day that they left and how they felt really negative. But she could have talked about some of the great things that really happened. She could have talked about her sons. She could have talked about these two wonderful additions to the families. Look at these daughters-in-law. She could have even talked about how they'd chosen the God of Israel over the gods of Moab. She could have talked about all of that. There was so much she could have said. And then she could have admitted her mistakes at the same time. And she could have maintained her integrity. But she didn't. Because the easy route was to grope around for sympathy. And that was why she was bitter. And it's almost as if God did not exist. Or if he did, he was just a convenient source of blame. You know, Frederick Nietzsche, the philosopher, once said, have you heard of the madman who lit a lamp in the bright morning and went to the marketplace crying ceaselessly, I see God, I see God. And there were many among those standing there who didn't believe in God, and so he, he made them laugh. And they said, is God lost? Has he gone astray like a child? Is he hiding? Has he gone on board a ship and emigrated? And so they laughed and shouted to one another. But the man sprang into their midst, looked daggers at them. Where is God, he said. I will tell you, we have killed him. You and I, we're all his killers. But how have we done this? How could we swallow up the sea? Who gave us a sponge to wipe away the horizon? What will we do as the earth is set loose from its sun? You see, Nietzsche's point wasn't that God does not exist, 
but that God has become irrelevant. Men and women might assert that God exists or that he doesn't exist, but it makes little difference either way. God is dead, not because he doesn't exist, but because of the way that we live, the way that we procreate, the way that we govern, and the way that we die. Because we live as, God, as if God doesn't exist. Just read the news. Listen to the political debate. Go on our streets on Friday and Saturday night. And you will see evidence of this. And Naomi's behaviour of shifting the blame is a classic example. Christian, this is a real challenge to us. How is our behaviour? What message are we sending out to the world? Is God dead? Or is he alive? There is, however, a positive note, and you'll be glad to hear that. Despite the fact that Naomi is attempting to cover up, there's actually three things buried in her complaint that really reveal her belief system. And it's a very interesting belief system she's got. Very simple. First of all, she believes God exists. And that's a good thing. A good starting point. Secondly, she believes God is sovereign. So God is in control. That's another good thing. But this one's not so good. She believes God has afflicted her. That's not completely true or brought judgment on her. See, the problem with Naomi is that she's forgotten her history. Because, you know, Jewish people, Jewish children particularly, are taught from a very early age the stories of the Old Testament. And that's something that actually we need to start doing as the covenant people. We need to start learning our Old Testament and learning the stories again and understanding how it all comes together, you know. The, old is in the, 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 old is, the new is in the old concealed and the old is in the new revealed. She'd forgotten about the story of Joseph, who went to a foreign country, sold as a slave, framed and put in prison. And he had every reason with Naomi to be bitter and say, the Almighty has made my life better. But Joseph kept his faith and God turned it all round for his good. And of course, the key to understanding Joseph's story is when he told his brothers, don't be afraid. I'm in the place of God. <coughs> You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, for good to accomplish what is now being done. Listen to this, the saving of many lives. And that's exactly what is happening here. Naomi knew that story. God has got a purpose in all things. But he's given us a mind, you know, to make informed decisions. He doesn't want to kiss us to kiss our brains goodbye. But if our decisions go pear-shaped... Don't blame God or anyone else. Look at yourself. Naomi, you see, is right to believe in a sovereign, almighty God who governs the affairs of nations and families and gives every day its part of pain and pleasure. But she needs to open her eyes to the signs of his merciful purposes as well. Because it was God who took away the famine, God who opened the way home. And notice something else. There's a detail of hope at the end of verse 22. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth, the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the har barley harvest was beginning. Now, over the next few weeks, we're going to see how that's very, very significant. See, if Naomi could only see what that's going to mean. But there's something else she needs to do. She needs to open her eyes to this girl standing with her. It's Ruth. What a gift, and yet Ruth... And her stand before the people of Bethlehem, she says, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. That's not true, Naomi. You're so tired with the darkness of difficult times and pain that you cannot see the light that God has provided. Now that is a familiar place, isn't it? Do you know what desperation is? If only she had the benefit of hindsight that we have and the great purpose that God had of bringing them to this point. Wow, she would have been a different woman, wouldn't she? But maybe that's why her story is being told, because she's human like us. But our stories tell a story. God blesses us and we bless others, actually. So in summary, there's four brief things I want to say to you. First of all, God is sovereign and knows our condition. His rule 
extends from our home to the highest authority in the world, governments, kingdoms, everything. God rules and has, his, has the ultimate decision. These ladies understood that no matter what they doubted, they never doubted that God was involved in every part of their lives. He gives rain and he takes rain. He gives life and he takes life. In him we live and move and have our being. He is all-encompassing, all-pervading reality. And even if we're in such a state that we're tempted to doubt, we don't need to because God is sovereign. Secondly, God's ways are sometimes tough. Naomi's experience had been tough. And it made her, I don't know if you use this phrase here, but it made her a bit of a nippy sweetie. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Anyone know what a nippy sweet is? Well, you're going to have to work that one out. I'm not going to explain it just now. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? You know, sometimes it can be a bit of a sharp edge to them, oh. don't they? Okay, so that's, that's what it means. Nippy sweetie, that's a good Scottish phrase. At least in the short term, she was a bit of a nippy sweetie. It'd be too easy for us to say with hindsight, well, you know, she was a bit daft anyway, going to Moab like that, allowing her sons to marry foreign wives. But actually, do you know something in the Old Testament and the New Testament that it never promises that believers will escape hard times in this life or that they won't make mistakes? But even if Naomi's difficulties were due to her disobedience, that makes the story even more encouraging to us, doesn't it? Because it reveals her humanity and shows us that God is willing and able to meet us and to provide for us even in the midst of extreme hardship and even when we make daft mistakes. Oh, that's great, isn't it? How good that feels, you know? You know, a great thing about being a slimmer's world is that if you pig out one day, okay, you can always say, can't we girls? You can always say, well, tomorrow's another day. It's true. Because if you've sinned, S Y N, okay? If you've sinned, then tomorrow's another day. But you know, on a spiritual level, it's exactly the same thing. When you make a daft mistake and you know you've done it, tomorrow is always another day. And God is gracious enough to meet you right there. And here's another thought if Ruth was brought into the family as a result of sin, I think that's really quite incredible that God chose, to be, chose her to be the grandmother of David and the ancestor of Jesus. Ancestor of Jesus. And it's a beautiful picture of grace. Whatever you do, don't you ever think that your sin of your past means that there's no hope for the future. Now that's not a license to go and sin, but it means you've got a liberty of knowing that God will forgive us and use us if we, we ask him to. Thirdly, God knows and uh, knows our needs and he meets them. You know, even in the worst of times, this period of judges where there was no order at all and different leaders were springing up all over the place, oh, and it was a crazy time in history. God was quietly moving in the tragedies of a single family to prepare the way for the greatest king of Israel. And all of this truth leads the writer of the Hebrews to say, listen to this. And what more shall I say, as he writes this great record of faith? I don't have time to tell you about Gideon, and Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. I can't wait till the trilogy comes out, actually. Okay. <laughs> who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword. Everyone thinks Game of Thrones is brilliant, and it is, but it's nothing compared to this. Look. Whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle, and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were taught and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and floggings, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, and yet none of them received what had been promised. God, listen to this, God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles. 
And let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. And let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, finished. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now tell me this, if you, if, does that get your motor going? Because if it doesn't, nothing else will. And fourthly, final thing, Trusting God brings freedom. If God calls, we can stay at home and serve him. We can leave home. We can leave our jobs. We can leave our country. We can make a radical commitment and undertake new adventures. You see, when we believe in the sovereignty of God and understand that he loves to work in the lives of those who trust him, the Holy Spirit then gives you a freedom and a joy and a peace that cannot be shaken, even in the hardest of times. I don't know if I've told you this story before of a young man who applied for a job as a farmhand. And uh, the farmer interviewed him and he said, well, what sort of qualifications have you got? He said, well, I, I can sleep when the wind blows. He thought it was a bit strange, but he really liked this young lad. And he said, all right, I'll give you, I'll give you a, a couple of weeks' trial. He said, okay. So off they went. In the middle of the trial, um, there was this terrible storm. And the farmer and his wife woke up and said, oh, that wind's blowing again. So they went out and they went round. And they started checking things out. And they found that the shutters of the farmhouse had been securely fastened. There was a good supply of logs had been set next to the fireplace. And they put their head around the door. And this young fellow was sleeping soundly. Then they went out and inspected the property. They found that all the farm tools had been put in a storage shed. That's quite unusual for farmers, I know. Safe from all the elements, the barn was properly locked. Even the animals were calm because all was well. And then the farmer understood the meaning of the young man's words. I can sleep when the wind blows. Because a farmhand, you see, did his work loyally and faithfully when the skies were clear and he was prepared for the storm when it broke. So when the wind blew, he wasn't afraid. He actually could sleep in peace. There was nothing dramatic or sensational in this young man's preparations. He just faithfully did what was needed each day and consequently, peace was his, even in the midst of a storm. And so we end this week where we began. A faithful God desires faithful followers. And we continue next week. Let's pray together, shall we? Our gracious God, we thank you that you have a desire for us to trust you. But we thank you, you don't leave us alone just to do it on our own devices. That You give us the grace that we need and you give us your spirit to live the lives that we should lead. But we would confess to you that there are many, many times when we just made daft mistakes and we felt we have going to have to start again. And sometimes we get sick of ourselves. But we thank you that you see us as a finished product, that you've got a great plan and you just desire us to trust you. So help us to do that, we pray, and help us to serve you well. For we ask it in Jesus' lovely name and for his glory alone. Amen. Amen.